The Chicago Bulls are predicted to be in the lottery this upcoming year uh, by Bleacher Report. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Plus, we're going to look at an ESPN survey uh, from NBA GMs that predicted Modest Busilis to finish kind of low in Rookie of the Year voting. We're going to talk a little bit about that as well. And Patrick Williams is, as, is voted as one of the top 30 power forwards in the game of basketball. We're going to talk about all that and more right after this. You are now tuned in to Chicago Bulls Central, your number one place for all Chicago Bulls news and content. What's going on, Bulls fans? Welcome to another episode of Chicago Bulls Central, your number one spot for everything Chicago Bulls related. I'm the host, Eric Hayes, but more importantly, you guys can follow the channel at Bulls Central Pod on every social media platform we happen to be on. With that being said, Let's go ahead and get into this content for today, y'all. So uh, Bleach Report has recently predicted the Chicago Bulls to be in the lottery once again. And this is, again, kind of the thing that we've seen uh, overall this season. There's been a lot of uh, kind of back and forth on the Chicago Bulls. You have some that think the Bulls could actually be a better team. It's mainly Bulls fans that I think I think it's still copium. Uh, you know, that's just my personal opinion. I still think there are a lot of Bulls fans that are coping with the fact that this Bulls team is just not going to be that good this year. There's there, you know, I've talked to a lot of you guys. You guys know I interact with Bulls fans all day, every day. It's part of why I host this podcast. Um, that really do think that this Bulls team is going to suddenly be a better team than last year. Uh, and, and you know, I mean, look, there are there's some signs to that. Uh, are there is there some excitement about Kobe White kind of being more featured starting at the season? And there is excitement over some from Josh Giddy as well, which I share that. You guys know over the summer, I've really been really kind of positive on Josh Giddy and what he can bring to the Chicago Bulls team being in a role that kind of fits his game a little bit more. Uh, so, you know, all those things are evident, right? And But, you know, the Bulls team is still a team that's going to suck defensively. No, they did not get better defensively. No, Modest Busilis is not a better than DeMar, on-ball defender than DeMar DeRozan. He does get some block shots, but he's not a better on-ball defender than DeMar DeRozan. Zach Levine is not a better, uh, no, I'll say he's a better on-ball defender than DeMar, but off-ball, he's garbage, right? So, you know, the Bulls, uh, even Jalen, uh, us, us getting Jalen Smith. Jalen Smith is a good rim protector, solid rim protector. He's he's become solid off-ball, but he's not a good on-ball defender either. Definitely not at the level of Andre Drummond. So this team has some things that are definitely going to be a detriment to them trying to make the play-in, right? But we'll see what happens. Like, they're hoping that this Bulls team is going to excel. They're definitely going to play a different offensive play style, those type of things. But Bleach Report in this uh, mainly pointed out the fact that and, and they kind of built it around this, is that the Chicago Bulls are going to trade Zach Levine the moment he has value in the trade market. Now, some will say, is that actually going to happen this year? How good does Zach Levine need to play to it? And, and the thing is, like, what does Zach need to do? Like, because we talked about it. He scored. Like, that's, I don't think anybody doubts his ability to score. I think they, maybe they doubt how much it impacts winning. So I don't even think Zach Levine coming out into the season and averaging 30 is necessarily going to change a whole lot because people know Zach Levine can fill it up. I've said it, between 2019 to the end of the 2022-23 season, he got hurt in 23-24, so that's why I'm removing that one. There are only nine players in the NBA that scored more points than Zach Levine. The NBA knows that Zach Levine could score. That shouldn't be the question. Now, his ability to stay healthy, the contract, that's not going to change, right? So, you know, but Bleach Report feels like in this one that Zach Levine, the, his value may go up in the trade market as it nears the trade deadline. We'll see what happens with that, right? What, what comes down to it has $138 million left on his contract and three years. So, you know, see what happens there. I also talk about Nikola Vucevic following him shortly thereafter. And then you, they look at the, the contributors that left for the Chicago Bulls. DeMar DeRozan, Alice Caruso, Andre Drummond, the former Bulls club, as they name it, with Owen Javante Green in that as well, right? Those are guys that left. And they said that it's going to be a tough road for the Chicago Bulls. Um, to go, you know, to the to the destination of making the playoffs. The article is built around teams and their playoff runs and aspirations and things like that. So, this is a Bulls team that uh, you're going to be seeing a dichotomy between, you know, how bad they're going to be and how how good people hope that they can be heading into next season. And this is a team that, you know, I've said it before. I I don't think that they've gotten better than any teams that were better than them last year. I just don't don't see that personally. I think when you look at the Eastern Conference standings last year. All those teams are going to still going to be considerably better than the Bulls, the Celtics, the Knicks, the Bucks, the Cleveland Cavaliers, the Orlando Magics, the Indiana Pacers. All those teams are definitely better than the Chicago Bulls, right? So that puts six teams right there above the Bulls. Then the Philadelphia 76ers, who's got much better, that's seven. The Miami Heat, I'm going to give them a little bit of the inside edge, right? Only because it's the Miami Heat, it's Heat culture. They, they really didn't lose anything, right? 
Um, and then you look at some of the players that they have on that team getting better than the young pieces that they do have. Okay. And then, uh, you know, having you know Terry Rozier hopefully healthy for a full season, that's another team above the Bulls. That's eight teams above the Chicago Bulls next year with teams like the Atlanta Hawks trying to be. Again, we'll see what happens there. I'm not necessarily saying that I feel the Hawks are going to be a better team than the Bulls. But the Charlotte Hornets, if, if LaMelo Ball is fully healthy, last time he was healthy, they were a 43-win team. And they didn't have a talent like Brandon Miller on that team. So, you know, then Miles Bridges is back on that team. Hopefully Mark Williams is fully healthy. That's a team I could see being better than the Chicago Bulls potentially. And then it comes down to the Toronto Raptors, right? So I have like the Hawks, the Bulls, and the Raptors all around that same area of teams that are going to all be vying basically for that 10th spot with the Charlotte Hornets probably vying for more than that if they're a fully healthy team. But then again, it's if it is a ball, brother, so you got to say if they're but then you have the teams that are actively tanking that I just don't think are going to be uh, anywhere close to, right? The Brooklyn Nets, definitely going to be a worse team than the Chicago Bulls. The Washington Wizards, I have no hope for the Wizards, despite who they drafted. And the Detroit Pistons, listen, they got Tobias Harris and Tim Hardaway Jr. on that team. Now, I get it. They're young pieces with a coach that believes in them more. Maybe K takes a step, things like that. But those are all going to be teams that are kind of all fluctuating around that bottom of the Eastern Conference. So. The Bulls do find themselves in a position where if their pieces do mesh together well, maybe they're contending for a 10th seed. That's kind of the way that I have it shaped out in my head is maybe contending for a 10th seed in that Eastern Conference, which is around the place that they were the last two years, right? So, you know, maybe they do that. We'll see what happens there. Again, you guys know my mindset. Uh, uh, one playing game, if you really don't have the chance to, to, you always have a chance to make it out the plan, right? Because it's one game. I think there's always a chance for that really no chance to really win a playoff series it's like you know we'll see what happens there but then when you look at the west flip that and look at the western conference which teams in the western conference are going to be actively worse than the chicago bulls and here's what i'll say the, the western conference only had four teams last year with records worse than the chicago bulls even though five teams did not make the playoffs right so even the houston rockets of being 41 and 41 had a better record than the chicago bulls the memphis grizzlies are definitely going to be a team in the western conference that are trying to be much better than what they were last season considering that they're going to have John Moran and hope that that roster, roster's a lot healthier. I think the Spurs, with the moves they've made, are going to be trying to fight for a play-in spot. I don't know if they'll make it, but they're going to be fighting for a play-in spot to get, get Wimby that experience. But then you have the Utah Jazz, the Portland Trailblazers, are really the only teams that I see in the Western Conference being actively worse than the Chicago Bulls. Again, keep in mind, all 10 teams that made the playoffs of the play-in with the, uh, the Western Conference uh, last year had at least 46 wins so that is just a crazy conference the 11th team in that conference had 41 wins so I'm just saying that there is a chance that the Bulls do end up keeping that pick to the Spurs but it really comes down to how this thing works out with the Bulls and you know so with that said let me get back back to the Bleacher Report article I don't I'm not surprised anymore by teams doubting the Chicago Bulls hell if you haven't heard it in my own voice I think the Bulls are going to probably win between 30 and 34, 35-ish win, uh, uh, wins next season. And so, you know, it is what it is when it comes down to it. But we'll see. And, of course, if the Bulls do make a trade deadline move that sends out uh, Zach Levine or Nikola Vucevic or Torrey Craig or any of these guys. Listen, shout out to Torrey Craig, by the way, who Torrey Craig just did a couple challenge with Meg the Stallion. They were laying in bed together. Shout out to Torrey Craig. Right now, now, I, I'm not going to make the joke I was going to make. I was going to make a joke about, Feet, but I'm not going to make the joke. I'm, I'm not going to get canceled today. We're not going to do it. So I'm going to shut up. But with that said, uh, you know, shout out to Tory Craig there. So we'll see what the Bulls and how the Bulls make moves either solidify, maybe run to the playoffs or play in, or they make uh, moves to kind of get themselves more assets. I think what the Bulls do at the trade deadline is really going to tell a lot of how the season is going to finish for the Bulls as well. Despite, but that does not mean that other players can't show growth over that time either. It's just, you know, how much does that growth affect the Bulls' playoff run? I think when you kind of talk about it there, like, don't get me wrong. I know there are going to be teams tanking for Cooper Flag. Make no mistake about it. I understand that. I'm not, I'm not blind to that fact. But I think that the Bulls just naturally, like I said, you look at them, even if you want to make a conversation, the best conversation I can make for the Bulls is maybe being the 10th best team in that Eastern Conference. And again, that's if a team like Atlanta doesn't work out or, or you know, whatever else that happens there. So 
We'll see what the future holds for the Chicago Bulls, but let me know your guys' thoughts down below. In regards to Bleach Report predicting the Chicago Bulls to be in the lottery, which would mean that the Bulls have a solid chance of keeping their top 10 protected pick. It doesn't mean that, because keep in mind, the lottery is the bottom 14 teams. So, with that said, it could very well end up that the Bulls still wind up in the playoffs. So, I mean, uh, missing out on their pick even is in the lottery. So, let's see what that brings for the Chicago Bulls. Next up, I want to talk about this. So, there's been a a survey. We all know it's it's a survey that happens before the start of every season. ESPN does it with NBA uh, with NBA execs, coaches, and scouts. And so one of the things that stood out there was the doubt around our boy Modest Bucillis. And so that was an interesting thing. So it looks like uh, that the NBA executives, the coaches, and the scouts had a bunch of players above Modest Bucillis in the potential Rookie of the Year voting. Those players came down to Zach Eady, who had the, who they gave the number one. He had the most number one place votes. Uh, in that to get Rookie of the Year this year. Uh, Reed Shepard was second. Then Alexander Saar, Stefan Castle, Tristan De Silva, and Rob Dillingham, all above Modest Busillas. Now, that's interesting for a few different areas. Now, Zach Eady is a player that is NBA-ready. I think a lot of people think that he, like, there's not a lot of upside with Zach Eady. He's kind of going to be who he's going to be. Now, that does not mean he's not going to grow his game some and learn and adapt. Everybody does, but you kind of know who Zach Eady is going to be, right? Now, He's coming to a team in the Memphis Grizzlies that are absolutely going to be trying to fight for a playoff spot and fight to go further than that, trying to make a run in the playoffs. And they're also a team that is kind of best suited to kind of overcome some of his shortcomings. Basically, everybody else on that team can get up and down the court. So even if Zach Eady can't, which he was much faster than Zach in the uh, draft combine than people were expecting, um, but and and being next to Jaron Jackson Jr., I think it's going to help him tremendously as well as Jaron Jackson Jr. can switch. He is the, the rim protector. He can shoot threes, right? So it, there's kind of a natural synergy there. Now, Reed Shepard is a different case. Like, you don't exactly know what's going to happen with Reed Shepard. Now, he is a very NBA-ready player. He had a great summer league as well. He's going to be going on a Rockets team that's really loaded, though, and so you don't know how much he's going to play or what role. But if he exceeds, you never know there. That's kind of one of the reasons why they could be looking to move on from one of their other young pieces because of the, them having a player like Reed Shepard. Alexander Saar. I, uh, he's an extremely raw prospect. And per our boy, Modest Busillis, you don't want to see Busillis. So, you know, it comes down to that. And then you have to look at uh, uh, players like Stefan Castle, who's going to be playing behind Chris Paul. I don't know how many chances he's going to, well, he's going to play, right? But I don't know if he's going to get the opportunity to have the rookie of the year type numbers. And then Tristan De Silva. Now, make no mistake about it. If you go back and look at my draft coverage, Tristan De Silva was a guy that I was extremely high on. I think he's NBA ready. I think that he's going to be uh, be able to help a lot of, uh, help his team. That also is a team that's going to be bringing him off the bench. He kind of could be uh, that Hami Hakez type role uh, next season that that he had as far as a player that just you know doesn't necessarily wow as far as like the numbers, but it's just going to be good. And you look at him going to that Orlando Magic team, them needing some scoring. Tristan De Silva could do a little bit of everything. I was not surprised he went right outside the lottery. Initially projected to be kind of a second round pick, but moved his way up draft boards. Tristan De Silva has a lot of upside, but not modest Busillis upside. And so this is definitely something that Busillis is going to look to use as motivation. Make no mistake about it. Busillis is already an extremely motivated and kind of a petty player, which is why I like him a lot, right? Is that, you know, he's going to use this as motivation. Every one of those guys, he was already going to try to kill. Make no mistake about it, right? But Busillis and his chances of winning Rookie of the Year. Now, we've talked a little bit about this earlier in the offseason, kind of more so after the draft. And it comes down to this. I don't know if Busillis is going to have the type of role that gets rookie of the year. Now, I do think that he is going to be one of the better rookies. And I do think that I know some, some Bulls fans share some doubt on if he's going to end up playing or not. Um, I, I don't have that doubt. Like I've said before, really, when you look at it, Billy Donovan's played more rookies than he did. Patrick Williams, Ayo Sumo both played early into their NBA careers. Dalen Terry, it was never expected for him to play because of how raw he was. Marco Simonovic just wasn't that good. And Julian Phillips was playing. He had started to play more and started to crack that rotation before he got hurt. So we have more data that actually aligns with Billy Donovan actually playing his work. It's one of those things that, it, like, Bulls fans have, have gotten this narrative and they've kind of stuck to it even without actually looking at, at kind of the data. Now, does he play his rookies the amount that some other teams do? No. But he plays his rookie. Now, Modest Busillis is also the highest draft pick that this team has had since Patrick Williams. And I think they're going to be motivated to play him because of that as well. So, yeah, I, I'm not too worried about, about uh, if Busillis is going to play or not. I'm just not. Now, 
we'll see how the start of the season goes because maybe it's another one of those situations where I look at it, then and I say, ah, oh, man, listen, uh, yeah, he didn't play him very often. So, you know, we'll see what comes down with that one. But I do think Busilis is going to play, but I don't know if he's going to play enough to be in that conversation to, to uh, for rookie of the year, right? I just don't know. And even look at Julian Phillips, how much time he missed. Julian Phillips played 40 games last season, 40 games, and was out basically the whole latter third of the season. So, yeah, Julian Phillips would have played a lot more. I think he would have easily probably played, probably gotten closer to 50, 55 games played last season, I think is where he would have been at had he not gotten hurt towards the end of that season. But, again, woulda, coulda, shoulda, right? It is what it is when it comes down to that. Um, even going so far as uh, he had multiple uh, months of averaging, averaging over 13 minutes per game. So, you know, I do think Julian Phillips would have played more. So it, it just comes down to how much Busillis plays. And I don't know if he has that type of role, that especially coming off the bench, because Zach Levine will be starting, that it then leads to Minus Busillis being in that Rookie of the Year conversation. Now, in that same poll, though, they're a lot more favorable to Minus Busillis as far as best rookies five years from now. So in that same voting, right, they looked at the rookies that would be the best player in five years, and Minus Busillis came in respectively on that list. So it was, re- it was uh, Shepard coming in first, Castle coming in next, Donovan Klingon, Nikola Topic, and then Manus Busillis, followed by Bub Carrington and Dalton Connect. So he got, he got some votes there, right? Still not initially the highest, right? Nikola Topic is one that, you know, considering, you know, the injury and things like that. But I think people do look at him as somebody who can definitely stand up a lot, right, and, and, and have a solid uh, a career overall. So watch out for that. But Busillis is going to use this as motivation. And make no mistake about it. Busillis is going to be motivated by being left off this. Now, I want to throw this one to you guys, though. Do you think that Busillis has a chance to win Rookie of the Year? And what chance do you give that? Now, let's say that Zach Levine is traded midseason. Busillis, then uh, Billy Donovan feels comfortable starting him. And then you have Busillis at the three. Could Busillis then theoretically do enough on the last third of the season if he has a solid enough season to push it? Maybe, but that's a lot of maybes. You're looking at maybe Zach Levine gets gets uh, traded, then maybe uh, uh, Billy Donovan starts Busillis over the back half of that season. So there's a lot of maybes there, but it's a conversation. Let me know what you guys think down below. Now, in that same poll, because it happens every single summer um, of ESPN's poll, um, on the Hoops Hype podcast, um, the Hoops Collective podcast, I'm sorry, with Brian Windhorst, Tim Bon Temps, who I can't stand, Tim McMahon, uh, they went over the results of that. And the Bulls, of course, stood out uh, because of their offseason season. And mainly they looked at the fact that the Bulls didn't get a lot of draft assets back from DeMar DeRozan, Alice Caruso. You got no assets back from the end, losing Andre Drummond. You got no uh, first-round picks back for that, right? And this is something that we've heard a lot, right? And when we're saying this, you're going into a market throwing the Thunder, have, uh, knowing the Thunder have been willing to overspend to get uh, the pieces that they want. McMahon said this, that's uh, the one I don't understand because when Wolves reported Caruso for Giddy, the question everybody had is how many picks are the Bulls getting? Which picks are the Bulls getting? And when the answer was none, I mean, didn't every single person you talked to around the league, uh, uh, anybody who wasn't absolutely flabbergasted by that? So, I mean, there's still some shock there. And I think that that resonates through Bulls fandom as well. I think a lot of Bulls fans are still, they look at that trade and they still look at it through the lens of, but we didn't get, how did we not get any first round picks out of this deal? And I can understand it, right? Like, yeah, even a protected first, some seconds, they end up trading five second round picks later on. Like, I get that. But I think, it goes back to separating the Josh Giddy portion of it. Like who Josh Giddy is as a player and who he can be in that upside. Yeah, he's probably better than anybody we could have gotten in this draft, but he still could have got something. Right? Even if it ended up being a first round pick that ended up not conveying because of the protections on it. You could have got I'm leaving it here with something, right? Like that should have been the Bulls' mindset. But you know, it is what it is. We made it through this. And it goes again to the look, the outlook of this Bulls front office by the league and a lot of people that talk about the league. It's just doubt around the front office's ability to strike the right deal at the right time and get value. And that is something that as you're trying to build a team and come out of the dirt, it's difficult when you just not only you sell low on your on your assets, but then you just don't get the right pieces back for it. Or, you know, you don't get as much back as you could for it if you traded earlier. You guys know the mindset I've decided to take with this is it's over with. Like the Bulls missed out on an opportunity to get more for their assets. They missed it. It is what it is. Had they decided they picked the direction at the past trade deadline. They could have got way more back. Yeah, the second half of the season would have sucked. But then, you you know, we would have went into maybe the draft with more draft picks, whatever it would have happened, maybe even more future. You just would have got more assets back, right? 
But, you know, at this point, this is where the, the front office is picked. And now they got to make do with the assets that they have. And they got to put something together that gets us to the place of where we want to be. And we'll see where that comes to that. Now, before we go, the last topic that I want to talk about is actually Patrick Williams. So Hoops Hype has been going through the top 30 players position by position. And Patrick Williams actually made the cut. He came in at number 23 on this list above uh, players like Rui Hachimura, Jonathan Isaac. Um, and so, you know, again, I've said this before. Bulls fans that talk about Patrick Williams as if he's a bust, I think, miss the point a lot, right? They miss the point because of a lot of what the Bulls have done, a lot of, of, of course, because of Patrick Williams' inability to stay healthy. Also, you know, the fact that he just doesn't really wow as being a fourth overall pick. But when you look at it, like, he's around the area of, when you look at players that are around him, uh, Cam Johnson at number 21, Gigi Jackson, the second-year player, at number 22, Patrick Williams at number 23, Rui Hachimura at number 24, Jonathan Isaac, who's one of the best perimeter defenders in the league, at number 25, Sante Aldama with the Memphis Grizzlies at number 26, and Jeremy Sohan at 27, and then you got Isaiah Stewart, Kyle Anderson, and Maxi Kleber rounding out that, 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 that to number 30. When you look at the top portion of this, um, you know, the top five in this, the top five power forwards, of course, you have Giannis Antetokounmpo, Zion Williamson at number two. Uh, Paolo Bancaro at number three, Pascal Siakam at number four, Cat at number five since he moved over there, a former Bull and Laurie Markkinen at number six, right? Um, and so the thing is, and I, and I wanted to go to, to the Laurie Markkinen point because not many people would have ranked Laurie Markkinen much higher than where Patrick Williams is right now when the Bulls moved on from him. Now, the Bulls kept him, hoping that he's going to hit a step or a leap or whatever it takes, and let's see where Patrick Williams, but again, Patrick Williams, the biggest thing with him is what's between his ears. It's not necessarily his game. We know that Patrick Williams has a game, right? But you've got to start showing the, the realization of that potential at some point. And up until this point, Patrick Williams has not shown that enough to where people feel com com comfortable and confident that Patrick Williams is really going to take a step up. So let's see if that happens. But you guys, as always, can let me know what you guys think down below. Make sure you guys are following the show at Bull Central Pod. You can send us any feedback, questions, comments, concerns. BullCentralPod at gmail.com. Lastly, if you want to leave a text message and our voicemail for the mailbag, the number to do so, 773-270-2799. We're the number one spot for everything Chicago Bulls related, but that's thanks to you guys. And like I like to end every episode on, go Bulls. Love you guys. See right if you can, y'all. Peace. This has been a presentation of The Break Break Media. Break Media. Media. Media.